Every year, the interagency fire community treats right around 3 million acres using either prescribed fires or wildland fire use. In 2005, over 7,600 prescribed fires were ignited, and we managed almost 500 wildland fire use fires. Although these fires were well planned out and managed, many of the same safety hazards exist that you find on going wildfires. The need still exists for situational awareness, adherence to your safety principles and guidelines, clear intent, and careful planning. In this module, we're going to look at the fire behavior characteristics in and around the Great Lakes, and then look at a prescribed fire that escaped control lines in Minnesota. This is going to lead us into a discussion on contingency plans. To get us started, we talked to a few firefighters from the north central United States. Let's listen to them talk about fighting fire in their area. We have a definite spring season from sometime in the middle to end of March until the first part of June when we start greening up. And then again in the fall after the ground freezes, we have a sh shortened duration fall fire season. The problem with the fall fire season is the days are much shorter and our burning windows are, are smaller. But we definitely have a spring fire season, but we also, during drought years, we can have fires in the summertime as well. January and February are months where we, as employees, spend a lot of time in training, keeping up with NWCG curriculum that we need to, um, going through simulations with our initial attack folks. We use simulation with initial attack and our incident management team. We usually have training sessions in, in the winter months prior to fire season. With our external partners, we set up training sessions in January and February, um, particularly with the vo local volunteer fire departments. Uh, I decide in the fall of the year prior to the fire season what training is going to be given and try to um, perfect that, get it into a format that's interactive and helps them um, learn easier uh, through simulation, a lot of simulation, both tabletop. I, we haven't used sand tables, but um, we use computer um, images and things like that. Um, but simple tabletop exercises as well and try to simulate um, wildland fires as best we can in January and February. In Wisconsin, we've developed a very close relationship with our volunteer firefighters, and I think that's essential to our mission and goals to suppress forest fires. We have a lot of forest fires in Wisconsin. We have thousands every year, and we do not have the resources nor the capabilities for structural protection that they have. So we depend heavily on the volunteer firefighters here and understand that they are a very key component to our fire suppression efforts and really we couldn't survive without them. We depend heavily on them and in having that close relationship with them we develop trust and an understanding of what roles are they play and what role we play and how best to accomplish the goal, the objective of, of suppressing forest fires. Basically we you know it's it's a common reoccurring theme uh, at any type of emergency incident that the issues are usually organization and communication. And those are all things that we can work on before the event occurs. Uh, I don't know of any event that works perfect, but there are certain things that we can do to prepare ourselves to be more organized and certainly have the communications down before the event occurs. The way that I would explain the zone concept as we use it here in Wisconsin is it's basically a predetermined uh, geographical area, a cluster of structures, that has been pre-mapped, uh, tallied on how many structures, it's been named with a unique name uh, convention, and uh, the idea is, is that very similar to like a division concept, it's a geographical place on the ground, a group of structures that in the event of a, of a forest fire we would expect that structural protection would be occurring in that zone. It's a way and a means to communicate and be able to organize our volunteer firefighters to be able to provide pro, um, structural protection. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, we experience fast moving fires and sometimes uh, we're looking at a type five fire early on and we hope to get uh, containment within that, uh, um, say 15 to 20 minute window. If that doesn't occur, a lot of times we will 
be moving into extended attack, and if that prolongs and moves into ex uh, project class type fires, the expectation or what we try to accomplish is to have a type two team up and running within two hours to help organize and manage the incident from a large magnitude of resources, both being LE, structural protection, and wildland protection resources, utilizing air resources as well. In the state of Wisconsin, most of our fires are wind-driven. Uh, we start to see a, a fair number of our fires escape from the typical cause, which is human cause, and the wind's pushing in the you know, teen category, anywhere between 15 and above. We start to experience some, some problems. RHs probably would be um, anything below 30. We start to see fire activity start to pick up, and roughly 20, anything below 20, we are preparing for uh, extreme types of giving conditions, or uh, we start to really staff up much heavier with those perspectives. I mean, in the event that we would push into the teen category, we'd be potentially looking and um, bringing on additional heavy dozers, putting on additional crews that would be available in the state. Our tractor plows, uh, we have roughly 76 of them in the state that provide a quick initial attack and have the ability to suppress a fire relatively quickly. Um, unlike the West, we don't deal with the terrain, nor do we have a, a tremendous amount of type two, type one crews in the state of Wisconsin, and tractor plows augment that for us to suppress fires, basically in the field types that we're looking at right now. State of Wisconsin suppression actions basically revolve pure and simple anchor and flank of fire and pinch the head. Um, that involves establishing strong anchor points, then burning out the line for our escape routes and safety zones back into the black and continuing uh, along the flanks until we actually overcome the head. And usually that's dependent upon the fuel type. And in most cases, if it's a project classifier, we'll catch it with the evening um, weather cycle of higher humidities, lower temperatures and lower winds. Yeah, the, the, the uh, Hudson Bay High, I guess the, the one of the, you know, if you look at historically at our large fires, they're set up by a Hudson Bay High that comes in, dries things out. We go two weeks without any rain. Uh, our our uh, sandy soils uh, dry out quickly uh, with the pine cover type in the spring of the year. Uh, the live fuel moisture bottoms out at that time of year. We got pollination going on. You know, third week of April, first part of May is the worst time to fight fire in, in this region of the country. That Hudson Bay High comes in, it gets established, you get very little wind, it kind of lulls you to sleep. And then when she exits, hold on to the horse because you know, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna get winds in excess of 20 miles an hour. We're gonna have wind-driven fires that will travel you know, one to three miles an hour, spot a mile plus and, and burn up, you know, anywhere from a couple thousand to 15,000 acres based on fire history in the last 50 years as part of the state or this part of the country. Uh, the 10 standard fire orders, I have to say, yeah, they're, I mean, they're valid everywhere. However, you, we have to look at it from our perspective and our eyes. You know, one of the big things, you know, in the orders and LCS is lookouts. Well, you look at our landscape, there is no place where we can put a lookout on the ground. To, to see over a large area. The landscape just doesn't allow for that. So what do we do? If we have a, a, a tactic that we're doing that is maybe a little bit risky, we gotta find a way to get a lookout and mitigate that risk. And most of the time, we have to look to the air. And we'll have to have a, a patrol aircraft that we will dedicate to be a lookout for this group of resources on the ground. And if we can't get that, we don't do it. So the, the 10 and 18, again, it's, you know, just like I, I said with the S courses, they're really geared towards a hand crew type situation. So we've got it on, in terrain and we've just got to look at it with, with you know, our eyes. And, but still very valid, very valid rules. Fire behavior characteristics are different all across the U.S. It's our responsibility as firefighters to gather this knowledge whenever we find ourselves in unfamiliar fuel models or climates. Now let's look at the Mississippi Meadows prescribed burn that was conducted on the Marcel Deer River Ranger District of the Chippewa National Forest in Minnesota.